Um, and so now we'll hear from some people who may be able to tell us how do we move forward in that struggle? How does that struggle happen? What can we do about it? Um, how can we make this movement happen? And so our next uh, expert will be a global economics expert, Dr. Marco Vangelisti, who will speak to you on some of these thoughts about how do we move forward in a positive way. Thank you, esteemed panel of judges, and thank you all for coming. Uh, to this historical moment. We're here today uh, to uh, put Chevron on trial by looking at it through the lens of the rights of nature. But we're also here, to a certain extent, to uh, put the system of law on trial. And I think we also need to put on trial the economics profession and the theory uh, on which it relies. So let me tell you very briefly about it. Mainstream economics mischaracterizes humans as economic agents that are exclusively self-regarding, insatiable, and pursuing their individual satisfaction by maximizing the consumption of goods and services while being constrained by income. The other economic agents are corporations, and they are maximizing profits subject to the constraint of cost. The free market is the mechanism that coordinates the action of all these economic agents through price signals, and according to mainstream economics, le leads to the efficient allocation of resources, products, and services in society. As the defense pointed out clearly, according to mainstream economics, Chevron's actions are the logical results of the incentives provided by the free market. Now the problem is that the market does not see the value of the ecosystem services that, the natural, uh, that nature provides, nor the natural resources that are provided for free, nor does it, does it see the cost of pollution. Nature does not charge us for oxygen production, pollination services, water purification, soil fertility, waste absorption, photosynthesis, etc. Nor does it charge us for the oil in the ground, water in the aquifers, or the lumber in its forests. We just have to pay for the cost of extracting those resources. Now these invisible values and costs are called the externalities, and a b new branch of economics was developed to account for them, called the environmental economics. It attempts to quantify in monetary terms the cost of pollution, and the economic value of ecosystem services and natural resources nature provides us for free. For example, the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change, published in the UK in 2006, which uses the methods of environmental economics, assessed the price of carbon pollution to about $100 per ton of CO2, reflecting the current and future economic damage caused by CO2 emission. According to Chevron's own website, Chevron produces 2.6 million barrel of oil per day for a total of 949 million barrels per year, equivalent to 3 million tons of CO2 emission per year. At $100 per ton, we're talking about $300 million of economic damage for which Chevron is responsible and currently not paying for. This does not account for the health cost of air pollution due to the 1999 and 2007 refinery explosions, for example, uh, nor are we talking about the refinery explosion of 2012, nor does it account for the pollution cost of more than 500,000 pounds of carcinogenic chemicals uh, Chevron routinely releases into the air and water of the Bay Area on a yearly basis. And yet, even environmental economics does not go far enough. It still believes in the characterizations of humans made by mainstream economics, and still believes in the primacy of the free market once prices are adjusted for externalities. Hence, the growth imperative remains in force. Quantifying externalities in monetary terms also requires the commodification of nature and the belief that financial capital and human technology are the substitutes for natural capital. If you run out of forests, 
will substitute wood with plastic. If we exhaust the fertility of the soil, we will grow our food in the lab. If we kill all the bees, we'll replace them with pollinator robots. By the way, under development right now. The type of economic theory that we need to become mainstream is ecological economics. It recognizes the existence of hard limits on the size of the economy itself, based on the sustainable harvesting of renewable resources. It also imposes limits on the overall amount of global pollution based on the absorptive capacity of global ecosystems. Ecological economics also brings to the fore distributional considerations based on intra and intergenerational justice and interspecies justice. According to ecological economics, we have already exceeded the biosphere's ability to absorb CO2, for example. Therefore, all CO2 emi emitting activities would need to end, while at the same time we would need to accelerate activities that sequester carbon, like reforestation, sustainable management of grasslands, conversion of, com of conventional farmland to organic and no-till agriculture, in order to bring CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere to the pre-industrial level of 280 parts per million. Viewed from the lens of ecological economics, Chevron, and all fossil fuel companies should seize all extracting and refining activities as a matter of intergenerational and interspecies justice. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, that whirlwind tutorial of ecological, environmental economics.